Good afternoon and welcome to um, Anniva um, Activating Annotation with D2L. Um, I am Sonia Visser from Hypothesis, and I am so happy to be joined today with Dr. Diana Applebaum from the Manhattan uh, Marymount Manhattan College. Um, just a quick um, little bio of uh, Dr. Applebaum. You know, she is the Associate Professor and Director of the Academic Writing Program at Marymount Manhattan College. Her scholarship is interdisciplinary, bridging writing and rhetoric, early American literature and history of science. She's reading. She's a reading specialist and educator trained in the balanced literacy approach who spent her career in deep engagement with writing, reading, and thinking pedagogies. She's a recipient of the New York Times Teachers Who Make a Difference Award, and she now teaches interdisciplinary history of science, literature, and first-year composition, and trains faculty in classroom metacognition. Diana, thank you for joining me today. We're so excited to hear from you. Um, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, if you uh, have any questions or want to learn more about something either one of us um, have discussed, please use the Q&A that's at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, chat has, is disabled, but Q&A is where you can answer any questions. Um, today, we're going to um, start talking about social annotation and why you would want to use that. Um, I'm going to give a quick demo of what hypothesis looks like in D2L. And then Diane is going to um, really dive in and talk about how she uses hypothesis in her courses. And at the end, we will have some time for Q&A. So please feel free to put in any of those questions that you have um, in Q&A and we will answer those at the very end. Um, so I'm going to get started and so happy you all joined us today. So hypothesis in teaching and learning. Um, what is hypothesis? So we are a tool that allows you to collaborate over online content that really makes discussions more meaningful, productive, and engaging. So we like to talk about how hypothesis makes reading active, visible, and social. And when we think about making reading active, this is really um, for students to really dive in and engage with that content. They are reading, um, whether it is um, a URL type of content, PDF, uh, whether you're using articles or textbooks, they're um, reading that, that document, they're commenting, they're asking questions, they're collaborating with their fellow students, with the faculty members, um, but they're able to do that right on that content. Um, hypothesis also makes reading visible, and we think about this from the perspective of the professor, the faculty member, they're able to get a window into what the students are really understanding, what they have questions about, is there any type of this, is there part of this material that they need more explanation on, um, and they're able to pull in um, other documents or websites to be able to either back up a point, ask a question, or provide some more insight. So that's a visible window that a lot of uh, faculty did not have prior to using Hypothesis. And then lastly, Hypothesis is social. Um, we are all very used to using different apps um, to be able to communicate with each other, whether that's with Facebook or Instagram, and being able to, you know, type in your questions, provide comments, having all of that social interactivity on the document is something students are very comfortable with, and it, it really is um, bringing them to a point that they can engage with this document and how they engage with um, a lot of other things that they're doing in their lives. I'm going to jump in and show you what hypothesis looks like um, in D2L. So this is our instance of hypothesis. And once you have um, actually integrated hypothesis into your institution's um, Brightspace D2L space, um, you would then see that um, you would have assignments where hypothesis is enabled. So we have one here. I'm just going to click on this uh, marketing assignment. I'm going to open that link. And you will see that hypothesis will appear as a sidebar right on top of this content. 
So um, the faculty, students, they can minimize hypothesis. You could bring that um, hypothesis out. Uh, you can actually see where we have annotations right here on the document. You could turn those off just by clicking this eye, and you can read that document cleanly. Um, in order to annotate, you would just hover over certain words, and you would be able to uh, choose a, a, to annotate or to highlight. So while you're able to collaborate, annotate, ask questions with, of each other, provide comments, you can also highlight, um, students can highlight for themselves and they can also take page notes. So they can really use hypothesis as a way to gather all of their data for this document and this assignment, and they can come back to the same place to prepare for whether it could be research papers or an exam. I'm gonna go ahead and click annotate and you'll see we have an annotation card that appears. Within this annotation card, you can choose to type your text and you have that functionality of bolding, make it, uh, making it italicized, et cetera. But you can also pull in different links to other websites, to other videos you can pull in as um, explanations to annotations. You can also pull in images and hypothesis can use it be, uh, be used across all discipline areas at your institution. We support uh, LaTeX language so you can actually annotate um, whether it's calculus or uh, formula, math, any of that that you want to do. So we we see it used quite a bit in STEM courses and math courses as well. Once you've explained your annotation, you then have a choice of doing one or two things. You can post this to the course you're in, or you can post it just to yourself, and you can toggle back and forth. So if students need more time, they, they have that ability to come back in, and then they can post that to the, uh, the course they're in. And once that annotation has been posted, then you can come in and you can actually thread that conversation. And this is where you're really interacting with um, fellow students with your faculty members, the replies have the same functionality as the original annotation card. And you can see some examples below where we've got an example here of the instructor asking, um, what is the most authentic pizza commercial you can find? And we've got uh, different videos here that will play right within that annotation. So you can see some examples of how, um, how you can use creativity within that discussion you're having um, you know, with your students. Um, I am going to now uh, turn it over to Diana to really talk about how she uses Hypothesis. You've gotten a, a little overview of what it looks like, but now she's gonna really um, dive in and how she uses it within her, her classes. Thanks so much, Sonia. Um, so I teach at Marymount Manhattan College, and I have been using Hypothesis for several years now since the pandemic, um, and I found it to be really transformative to my teaching. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the ways that I use it um, and to demonstrate some of the ways that I use it or to show you some of the student annotations. Um, What's been transformational about it is a couple of things. It's a labor side. So before social annotation, I was always having students annotate, but they were annotating, of course, by hand. And so I was using it as a touch point to see what they were saying about the text and to check in with students before the class would begin. Um, so this is another form of checking in with students where I can reply directly to their annotations or I can pull their annotations into the class discussion right away. Um, but it's easier for me to kind of scan before the class begins and to really have a sense of who I want to pull into the conversation. Um, so it really has maximized student engagement in that way. Um, I'm never going back. I keep saying this about hypothesis. I'm never going back to students using um, handwritten an annotations, although they're, of course, welcome to use handwritten annotations as well. Um, and they're also, of course, our purposes to um, private annotation, um, which Sonia showed you, you can kind of turn on and off and you can kind of see what others are inputting and and or begin with your own thoughts. So you have that choice as well in hypothesis if you don't want to um, socially annotate right away. Um, one of the things I wanted to start with was um, a short video tutorial that I um, give to students on the very first day of classes. And I have a couple of these. I'm only gonna play one, it's about five minutes long. Um, 
And it's a tutorial on how to annotate with Hypothesis. Uh, and then I have a second one which draws them to the links that Hypothesis provides for annotation support, annotation help, and good annotation. Um, and the reason I think this is so important is because these are individualized videos that I'm doing for my own courses where I'm referencing students who are in the course. Um, and I'm also showing them the kind of nitty gritty how to actually go about doing the annotation. It's really quite simple, but as with any new text, sometimes when students are new to it, there's a sort of resistance. So you want to really make it as simple as possible for them. Um, and so I'll just play this for you so you get a sense of how I talk to the students and um, what purposes I outline for them in the annotation. And then we'll get into some of the other uses. Good annotating with hypothesis, which is oops. Do you hear that? No. Let me try that one more time. Oh, there we go. Okay. We did hear it. You did hear it. Okay, great. Fantastic. Another fantastic tool that I've started using in my classes in the last couple of years. It's a social annotation tool. Anytime you see a little Lego like this next to the reading, that means that it's in Hypothesis. So anything that I post on Brightspace for you, whether it's a link to a podcast or a text itself um, that isn't a physical copy of a book, is going to have this little Lego next to it and is going to allow for social annotation so that you all can actually have a discussion. I'm going to show you another class from last semester. Uh, a couple of you maybe you might recognize this class. Um, so let's look a little bit at what this might look like. So here's a reading. You're going to click open the tab and in the reading the text will pop up in this screen here. And then on the right, you'll see a stream of annotations. It's a stream just like you would see in, I don't know, social media. You are scrolling down and you're seeing everybody's annotations. And so I'll just start backwards for a moment. One of the great uses of this tool is to really be able to take a look at what everybody else has said and thought and to kind of orient your understanding of the reading to everybody else's. If you're the first one, then you're the first one, and then you come back and you might be replying to other people. But you can see here that there are methods for replying um, as well. So the way this works is quite simple. You are reading, you see something that is interesting to you, you highlight it, and then you have two choices. If you highlight, that's something that only you will see. The class will not see that. If you highlight and then you click annotate, this little box right here will pop up and that will allow you to make a comment of any kind. Um, okay, and then you're gonna, you have the option to post it to the class or you have the option to post it only to you. You're always gonna post it to the class unless there is something that you kind of wanna remind yourself of or there's some specific reason that you wanna post it only to yourself. But the idea here is that everybody is uh, interacting in the text with the text right here. So I'm gonna click post it's going to pop up right here. If I want to edit my post, I can just do that. Now, if I want to respond to somebody else's post, I'm going to click this little response button and I'm going to say whatever I say, and I'm going to click post. And then somebody might respond to you and it becomes an actual conversation. A couple of other features here. You'll see this annotations here, you can um, shut off the annotations if you don't want to see the text highlighted. So in other words, if you want to approach the text with your own ideas first and then see what others have, have done with the text, you might shut off the highlights. Um, then there's something called page notes. Page notes are really for if there's something that you can't highlight, like an image, for example. Um, to add a page note, you're just going to click this little button right here. Um, this sketch is um, not true to life and I'm going to click post and now I have a page note right here um, and these page notes are really useful in particular when it comes to images so for example if I head into this text right here where we have an image you'll see actually that folks pretty much just highlighted and still did the annotations. But what you could do is you could head into the page notes. Occasionally, we will also use page notes to kind of come up with uh, ideas together during class time. So these might, these might be, this might be a space for free writing as well. Um, finally, if you want to refresh as you are 
annotating there will be a little red button here that pops up if other people are annotating at the same time as you so you can press that little red arrow and that will refresh the annotation and actually one more thing if there's somebody in the class who you know just has amazing 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 annotations and you want to look at their annotations i'm gonna pick bella here because she's in this class as well and um, i'm going to search for her name and it will pull up all of bella's annotations um, you can also search for particular keywords. Um, you could search for your own annotations if they get kind of luminous in here. So again, this is a really great tool um, to use for all sorts of things. And then we're going to talk about some of the bigger features of the tool in the next video. Okay, so I'll stop that there um, and just say that... Um, that's just something that they'll watch right at the very beginning. And then, of course, there will be in the first few weeks, lots of practice with the tools. So synchronous together classroom annotating of a text so that all the features and all the hows are there. Um, something else that I think is really important to this is actually just introducing annotation and talking about why annotation is important. And Hypothesis does have some really great um, tools for that, but I'll just show you a couple of my own. Um, I'm very big into metacognition. I always tell my students how and why they're learning something. So before we even get to annotating, we talk about why we annotate, right? What it means to be an active reader. Um, I like to use the metaphor of scuba diving versus snorkeling, or are you putting your toe in the water? Are you just under the surface of the water? Or are you really getting into the depths of the text? Um, and then just very basic things that I'm seeing a lot with first year students, and I'm sure you see with upper level students as well, and I do see with upper level students, um, comprehension, not skipping key parts, slowing down, right, providing food for writing, which is a really big one, getting in the habit of thinking critically, um, which is something, of course, that AI can't do for us. And um, and then thinking about the kinds of annotations you can do. So I do give students this page also, which I have them kind of keep out as they annotate. And I like to think of annotation in two categories. One is readerly or thinking about texts. And again, text can mean anything. Text can be images, videos, audio, you know, all sorts of things are text. So broadening the idea of text is also a really important um, thing to do. But readerly as responses, right, where students are responding with a question or comment or an inference. And then um, the deeper level or the harder level, which is the writerly annotations, or just thinking about what the text is doing craft wise, right? And thinking about rhetorically, how is the text working? So this is something that I give them. This is something they have on Brightspace. And this is something that for the first few weeks, as they're annotating in hypothesis, they're keeping next to them and really making sure they're looking at and trying a few different kinds of annotations. You'll always have students who have annotated in the past, but always annotate the same way or they always annotate with the same three or four things that they've been taught to annotate with, um, maybe just finding vocabulary maybe just highlighting, which often is not very helpful. Um, so it's a really, really great skill building tool to have them practice all of these different things in social annotation and seeing students, their classmates doing the same. Um, I wanna show you these board notes, which just came up this past Monday in my class. And I know this is very, very messy here, but we were um, near the end of the lesson and I was trying to make space on the board, but um, we were talking about what it felt like to annotate in hypothesis for the first time. And this was a lab class. And the lab class um, is a, a team talk class. So there you have a main class and then I teach the lab, which is more skills-based, it's a writing lab. And so these were some of the things they said. They said your classmates might catch something you don't catch. It feels like ideas kind of popping off like a popcorn, like popcorn popping in the microwave. Um, you might have joint commiseration, like somebody might say in the text, like, hey, you know, I don't understand this or I'm confused and you feel better because you were also confused and you think everybody else understands what the text is saying. Um, I love this, that it opens up doubts about your own thinking, which is so critical, right? Or it's a confirmation of analysis or confirmation of your confusion, offers new perspectives, allows you to take the class, your classmates' inputs and synthesize them into potential themes. Um, one student said it helps you find a counter argument. So maybe there's somebody who finds that counter argument for you. So, um, so all of those are really fantastic. And then um, just this idea of taking the text and 
um, writing from it, which is such a crucial, um, crucial part of annotating and why we have our students annotate at the very least in writing. Um, it is so hard often for students to start to get started. And this is one of the things that really just tremendously helps, which is just choose an annotation to write from and free write from that an annotation, right? It doesn't even matter if it's somebody else's annotation. You can give credit to that person in a paper or in a project, but um, but what is it changing about the way you're seeing the article or the way you're understanding? And you can see that these students were responding to, some of them were responding to images, some of them were responding to um, just quotes or other annotations that they had put in. And then in my own comments to them, I'm pinpointing within their free rights, what could be useful for them to draw out into their papers or into their projects. Um, okay. Um, I have some other ways that I use this tool that I'd love to share, but Sonia, I'm just going to pause here. Are there any questions at the moment uh, or? Yes, if you don't have any questions, I was going to remind folks that if you have a question, please put that in the Q and a, um, so that we can make sure we can, uh, answer those at the very end, but I think we're, we're okay for right now. Okay. Awesome. All right, so um, here are some of the other ways that I just want to throw in there that I use this this tool, and I'm happy to share these notes with folks um, if they'd like them. Um, so the idea of the page notes discussion and the collaborative scholarship, this was something that Sonia showed, like this idea that you might ask a question, right, potentially in page notes, or it could be as part of the annotation, and then have students replying to it. So um, I'll show you what this looks like. This is a, a chapter that I just had published this past year where I incorporated hypothesis. And you can see here on the lower left, um, in the page notes, I ask students, what's striking you about this image? What are you seeing here? How is transcultural encounter em embodied here? And then there were all of these sample replies that students brought in and um it was fascinating um all the discussion that opened up from that one little um discussion in the text in the archive of the text um which was very different than having it be in discussion board because it was right there right with the image side by side so if the student is coming back and saying you know i remember that image i really want to write about it and um, I, you know, I'm going to look at my syllabus. I remember it's in week five and they go in and they find all of their classmates, right? Little free rights about it. Um, and this really just, you can see that they're kind of doing this kind of work of collaborative scholarship. They're making meaning, right? By reading, rereading, thinking, building, writing, and testing ideas together. And you're seeing all the different ideas coming together in that way. Um, and that's really a fantastic way to use that tool. Um, okay. Diana, we did have one question. Um, sure. Do you assign grades for annotations? I personally don't. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I know that there is a feature where, right, that you can, um, have it input directly into grade center. Is that right? If the student completes the annotations? Yes, there is. Correct. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally grade provide a comment that goes specifically to the student in the grade book. Yes. Right. Um, I don't, I use it mainly and I'll have it here. I have it here as monitoring student thinking and comprehension. To me, this is really a sort of self assessment. I'm really looking to see what students are getting out of the texts and, um, you know, if cor te course texts need to be revised or changed up, or, um, if I need to come back to particular texts, because there was a lot of confusion. So I'm monitoring right. In that way, I'm also monitoring for quantity and quality of annotations. And there are some students who, you know, write the bare minimum. And then there are students who are writing entire essays in the annotations. Um, so I know that some of our instructors in the writing program, for example, tell students, you must have five annotations and each annotation must be two sentences long or something like that. Um, and that's perfectly fine. If you need to set those parameters, um, I'd like to keep it open so that students feel free to really just think with the text. Um, and then if I see that a student really is not progressing in terms of being able to expand their ideas or write more, then that might be a conversation I have with students individually. 
Um, but I do know that there are students, there are professors who more data wise, right, um, monitor how much students are annotating and the quality of their annotations. Um, so, in with that, I would just kind of say here this idea of increasing participation, which is another reason, really a tool for the classroom. Um, when we go into the text, I jump straight into the annotations. And typically what I do is right before class begins, I skim over the annotations. And just in my mind, I highlight, there used to be this little flag feature, Sonia. I know it wasn't for that purpose, but I used to flag little annotations that I wanted to come back to that I felt were really interesting. Um, so now I just jot them down either in my lesson plan or I remember them, but I will come in and I'll say, you know, Jesse, you had a really interesting annotation. Can you start us off? Can you just read what you wrote? So it's a really low stakes, easy way to warm up for discussion um, and to kind of offer this, you know, praise and validation to students for, for thinking, for thinking through the text. Um, I kind of use this in a stealthy way too, in the sense that um, if I have students who are quieter, uh, what I'll typically do is I will call on those students first to read their comments. And I do find with quieter students that when you get them started in the discussion earlier, they warm up. It's sort of like training, like physical training or something. They warm up a little bit and they're more likely then to participate or talk on their own later in the class. They just need that little nudge or that little bump. Um, so, so I do find it's great in that way. Yeah, you had a question um, on the Q&A that I think goes right along with this, what you're talking about. And um, the participant asked, how often do students reply and converse with each other? Is is there a set amount or is what is a that lot? Like? I would say a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Um, sometimes it's just, you know, um, agree, you know, like or emphasis. I mean, I can show you a couple of these um, and what they look like, but I find that they do a lot more replying and talking to each other in the context of hypothesis than they do in any other kind of discussion board. And in general, um, discussion board is really not, I've not found any discussion board in any LMS to be effective for actually creating digital conversation. Um, however, hypothesis is extremely, extremely good for that. And you can see here's a text that students really ran with 284 annotations in a class of maybe 12 students, you know, and you can really see like students um, just, just pulling and pulling and pulling. And, you know, sometimes they're replying directly, right, to a particular point that somebody is making. Um, some you can see this is a, a, a pretty involved response. Sometimes they're just emphasizing. Sometimes they're just saying, I agree. This is similar to my thoughts. So it's like kind of confirmation or affirmation, which is really powerful socially for students when they feel that, you know, somebody in their class was thinking the same thing as they were reading or is maybe agreeing with a thought that they've had. Um, or just like an exclamation point, right? Like exactly, exclamation point. So it doesn't have to be um, something profound. And I say that all the time or LOL, right? Um, it doesn't have to be profound because the, the purpose of building this conversation or the way that this conversation is built is socially and learning is so social for them. So you can see here, right? I know they are holding frogs to preserve them from going extinct, but how do these frogs that are removed from their ecosystem affect other organisms that they were in contact with? Another student, oh, sorry, the same student extends and says, can trying to prevent a mass extinction create a new one for another organism? And then another student extends that thought, right? What are the repercussions of removing a current crucial species from their environment? So you can really see students conversing in the texts and um and of course you can prompt that so here's another exercise that i just did the other day um where is that one nope maybe not um but you can prompt that so you can have them so when i have them practice this at the very beginning what i ask is that they reply right, to one person, and first just reply by text. Then I have them reread the stream, 
and say, now reply with an image, now reply with a video, now reply with a link to an article you recently read, or name a song that connects to what was said. So the idea is to train your brain to think in all sorts of ways and to make connections across modes and texts and contexts. Okay, um, let's see. Some of the other ways that I use this. Um, catch up is a big one. As we all know, our students don't always read. They don't always look at the text before they come to class. And this is a really great way to involve and engage those students, even the ones who are underprepared or unprepared. And sometimes we don't want to do that because we feel like you should have done the reading. But it makes the class so much richer if you can pull everybody in and everybody can say something and the student can then go back and read it on their own, right? Um, so for students who haven't read or who skimmed or read poorly, I'll always give a moment in general before we get into the text. Everybody just take a few moments, refresh your, refresh your memory, go through the stream, read a few different comments, um, and then we're going to jump in. And that relates to the pause and think. Sometimes if nobody's talking in class, we'll say, okay, let's just stop for a minute. We're going to pull this quote or this scene, or I'm going to ask you a question in page notes, and we're going to generate some free writing. And now everybody has something to say. So that's another way that we can use it. Um, this one I really like targeting annotations for specific skills and maybe this fits with the, the grading comment. You could potentially grade targeted annotations if you're testing certain skills or you're looking at certain skills. So, for example, things like rhetorical analysis, like how is a piece making an academic intervention? Where is the source conversation? Can you find the argument or some sort of a response? Right. Um, comparing with other text. So, like, again, making those connections. Um, so we once had an adjunct who suggested this, and I thought it was a great idea um, where a group can go into one text and then hashtag a part that connects to another text. So, like, they tag parts that connect to different texts so that if they are doing some sort of a comparative analysis or synthesis or they're pulling multiple texts together, they can actually look at how those texts are connecting and come back to those tags. And that connects to the hashtag for connections or for other reasons. Um, I actually just had a student come into my office right before this, and she said that she got so into the text that she went back into it three times and annotated, and she started doing all the hashtags um, for herself so that she could see um, so that she could see what uh, was happening and what she wanted to return to in the text. So this was the student and there she had the most annotations of anyone. And so she had tagged for herself certain vocab that she wanted to return to um, claims so she could come back and see where that claim is and see if that's part of the claim. Um, and this is really helpful for other students. But of course, she can also just do this as only me if she's pre prepping to write a paper and she's looking for where those claims might be or what she might be interested in doing in the text. Um, I know earlier on you had speak, you mentioned something about the training to think, that hypothesis really helps train to think and kind of where they're not using AI. But I see, it seems that a lot of these types of prompts and how you're using it in, in this way is, is, is also, um, you know, kind of, combating the AI because you're you're really targeting, you know, some of the things that that really help them think. I mean, so I'm not sure do you do feel that way as well. Yeah, I do. And I think the more you keep it low stakes, which is sort of why I don't, you know, grade and I really kind of give them free reign over the annotations unless I see that I want them to direct them in a particular way mm -hmm. is because I want samples of their writing. I want to see how they write. I want to see how they think. Um, for when they submit more formal assignments. And I want to, like you said, train them to think and show them that these barriers, whatever they are, the mental, emotional barriers that prevent them from trying to get their ideas down on paper, it doesn't have to be such a slog. It doesn't have to be such a, I have to sit down and do this in a particular way, right? Um, but I think the skills-based part of it is also really important when they know how to do it 
it really takes some of that stress of producing the kind of more formal assignments off. So like this, you know, like actually doing that together with them, training them when to annotate, how often to annotate, how to chunk readings for annotation. So when we're reading together, I'm always cueing for them, right? We're going to stop every paragraph and annotate. You might think you have nothing to say, but you do have something to say, right? And so that more, the more they, they practice that kind of thing, the better they get at, at thinking. And that's really what prevents, like you said, plagiarism um, mm -hmm. or makes them feel like maybe they don't have to plagiarize. Um, yeah, so I think, I, I mean, um, I think I, I hit most of these. I mean, I, I do love, you know, the silent discussions, which are just going into the text and we're all silently annotating. This is something you could do in online courses. It's, you could do it in person with everyone having their laptops out. Um, and I love that, like that you're actually having a conversation on the page. It's really interesting. Um, synthesizing, they're pulling together other classmates' thoughts. And then even collaborative feedback, this is a really good use of the tool too. have them socially annotate or provide feedback on course documents like the syllabus, or if you're creating an AI policy together, right? Have them provide feedback on it or generate it together or generate a rubric and criteria. Um, and then I will just say that it really, to me, it's an archive, it's a moment in time. And what I love about it is being able to like, look back and see what my students were thinking at that point in the course, um, where their terminology or understanding of terminology has become clearer. And this is something I have them do go back and reflect on, um, where their understanding has grown. And of course, in real time, I'm able to assess how well the course is going and how well students are understanding, um, and I think I've spoken about all of these already, but I do really find that students become better at conversations. They become better at collaborative thinking and discussion um, and discovery and that they learn how to have academic discussions in texts. Um, and that's just not something that they typically do in discussion board or any of the other where you say like, okay, write a post and then reply to three other people because there's something very artificial about that, right? Um, Whereas this can happen both synchronously and asynchronously. Um, and then I'll, and um, this is, I guess, where I'll end since um, I was asked to talk about any of the challenges and maybe Sonia can address some of these, but I do find it to be a little cumbersome for peer review. That's pretty hard to have students up, you know, to have them upload drafts and figure out how to reply there. So something like Google Docs might still be more useful for that. Um, Scans, um, I know that this this has over time gotten a lot easier um, in terms of OCRing and making sure the texts are able to be read within Hypothesis. Um, there is a little bit of work that has to be done at the forefront, and I personally like to just set it all up before the semester begins. Um, but having said that, it's not hard to set up a reading in Hypothesis. It's very easy, so you can always do that on the go as well. Um, Annotating model text is another great thing that you can do in there, having a student model thrown in and annotating it together. So I think those are those are all of the uses that I thought of as I was preparing for this, but I'm happy to take questions or um, or yeah. throw around some other thoughts. Tell the, tell the group to just put any questions they have. I just had a couple. Um, I know you you know you don't give grades for using hypothesis, but have you seen um, grades increase or engagement increase? You know, what what have you seen since you've started to use hypothesis in regards to grades and, and that that piece of your course? Right. Um, well, I do think, um, yes, because they're actually getting deeper into the text. So what I'm finding is that especially final projects that are synthesis final projects or research papers or final kind of products that we're having them produce, they're building from all of that understanding and they have an archive of that understanding. So it's in one class space. It's not like in their notebook somewhere hard for them to find, right? Um, so I do find it's a lot, it, there is a really, really big benefit. And I find students pulling from those annotations a lot towards their final projects and making those final projects a lot um, deeper, more interesting. Um, 
And sometimes it isn't their own ideas that they're pulling from. Sometimes they're pulling from their classmates' ideas, which is also great and fine, um, especially if they're expanding or extending or getting a nugget or a seed of something from that conversation. Yeah, that's great. We um, There's some folks on the, the webinar today that haven't used Hypothesis before. So do you have any advice for um, someone who you know hasn't started using but would like to start using? Mm-hmm. Um, I would just keep it simple and I would start using it. Um, just, you know, put in one reading through hypothesis and practice together in class. Just, you know, be honest with the students and say, this is your first time using it too. And then, you know, just take a very simple text, take something that's one or two pages, stop every paragraph, read aloud, have different students read aloud paragraph by paragraph and annotate together and then do various little exercises with it. So, um, after you've annotated the whole text, now go in, read your classmates' annotations, and write a reply. Practice the reply feature. Now go in and reply with a, an image. Now go in and reply to a specific quote. Um, now I'm going to write a question in page notes, and you're all going to free write to that question. Um, now we're going to have a conversation about this text, right? Refer us to specific parts or specific annotations. or Sometimes I have everybody go around and just share an annotation and see if that sparks a conversation. Um, so it really is a very easy tool um, to get going with and you don't have to use. I mean, there aren't even complex features in it that I know of, right? But you don't have to get you don't have to get crazy with it. It's really a very, very simple tool that students pick up very, very quickly. And it's pretty intuitive. Um, and I don't know, I just, I would just really, really recommend that everybody use it. And that's sort of the, the pedestal that I've been on here at Marymount too. That's wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, well, I, let's see, we might, I think we've got another. Um, oh, so um, we had one person ask, also this tool can be used for group projects. Any thoughts? Yeah, yeah, you can use it for group projects. Absolutely. Um, I mean, you can upload particular texts that the groups want to annotate together into there. Um, I've had group work with particular texts where they begin from the annotations that they've already done. And they, you know, again, you can have very specific tasks, like take an annotation from one of your group members and expand on it or um, all of you read aloud your annotations and then decide on one kind of key takeaway you want to share with the class. Or um, again, if there's some sort of a project that a group is building, they can be using that text um, as the basis of that project and those annotations as the basic basis of the project. They can also be annotating together. They can be reading and annotating together in small groups if you're splitting up texts or if you're splitting up parts of the text, if it's a very long piece, for example. Great. Um, one more here. Lisa um, says that she teaches and designs asynchronous classes. Do you have any ideas about using hypothesis in that setting? Yeah, I mean, I don't see why it couldn't be used asynchronously. I mean, essentially, most of the texts that students are annotating in for my classes are over ho for homework. So they're not doing them in class. We do we do do annotating in class and we do practice in class, but um, the majority of it is asynchronous. So they might be in the text at the same time as a classmate, in which case they can press that little refresh button, or they might be doing it on their own. And that's where, again, you can kind of reflect on or have them reflect on what did it feel like to see your classmates' annotations or what did it feel like to be the first one in the text and then to come back to it. Um, but yeah, I don't see any reason why you couldn't use it in an asynchronous class. And in fact, um, I could see it being a real boon to a class like that, especially for you, since you don't know the students face to face, um, at the very least, because it's so low stakes, you're having samples of their writing, even if it's just a few sentences at a time, and you're able to put those up against more formal products that they're submitting. Mm -hmm. um, 
yeah. to avert I, plagiarism. Yeah, I, I was going to share just um, working with as many institutions as we do that I the feedback I get from faculty that teach in those asynchronous classes is that it it does um, allow for the students to even get to know each other a little bit where they mm -hmm. may not have that experience specifically even in just using a discussion board because that can be pretty static. But when you're really having a conversation over what they're reading and they can uh, you know dive deeper into that they there's there tends to be engagement with the content and with each other that um, you may not have that type of a community feel. Um, so, um, it looks like I think we don't have any more questions. I'm going to go back to the slides. Um, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to put those in. But I'm going to just quickly uh, touch on a couple other things before we wrap up today. Let me share my screen. I went right back here. So um, I did want to talk about, so in, um, there are some folks here that are customers of ours and some that are not. So I wanted to talk about our partnership program. Um, we have over 400 institutions that work with us. Um, and when you become a partner um, um, with us, we offer pedagogical support. So um, we have trainings, uh, workshops, and as Diana said, hypothesis is really easy to use. There's not a lot of functionality, um, but it's more about how to use social annotations, the types of prompts, the questions, and that's really where we are in our workshops and during our trainings, we spend a lot of time discussing those things. Um, we've got uh, Liquid Margins, which is um, on our website that um, you can really um, go in and you can see how faculty are using Hypothesis in different um different uh, discipline areas. Um, it's a really great resource. Uh, we also have um, resources for social annotation. We've got examples, starter assignments, um, a lot of those tools that you can use to really get started with Hypothesis. Um, and then we also have an educator forum that um, you are a part of. Um, also within um, our partnership, we offer Hypothesis Academy. And this is an asynchronous course where you all can come together and really dive in and start to build out um, you know, your own content, think about how to use um, Hypothesis, how to use collaborative annotation. Um, our success team manages the Hypothesis Academy and um, have experience in instructional design, have used Hypothesis in their own class as adjuncts. So it's a really great way to just dive in and get your hands really dirty and uh, really get a lot out of that that you can then translate into your own courses. Um, we have a cohort that's starting next week. Um, and then we also have have social annotation in the age of AI. So that really dives into not just the basics of hypothesis, but how do you can use certain prompts, um, even as Diana talked about different um, ways that she uses hypothesis to really engage students where they're not really needing to think about using AI. We have um, partner workshops that anyone can join. Um, again, different ideas on how to use multimedia, tags. Um, one of our recommendations to get started with Hypothesis if you're using at the beginning of the semester is annotating your syllabus. Very low stakes um, way to get visibility into what your students are excited about. Um, we also, using Hypothesis in small classes, um, you know, giving feedback, you know, a lot of different topics and these um, are available for anyone to join. Um, we have um, partner workshops throughout the semester. Um, next week, I wanted to highlight our um, uh, liquid margins, which is going to feature um, AI in the future of learning. So a, a topic that I think everyone can really um, resonate with. And um, we're featuring faculty from SUNY New Paltz, the University of Oklahoma, and Western Idaho. And that's going to be next Thursday, February 15th at 1 p.m. Um, please register. Even if you can't attend, we will then send you that recording. It will be live on our website later, but we can personally send that recording to you um, if you register um, and or attend as well. So. 
And then finally, for those that are not partners with us yet, we have a spring starter offer um, that provides uh, discounted pricing. We obviously will offer then the faculty workshops and our implementation would be no cost and you'd be able to, to jump into our Hypothesis Academy. So if that's something you're interested in, um, you can put something in the Q&A right now or you can go ahead and reach out to us at education um, at Hypothesis to learn more. So we'd love to have you uh, you know, on that as well. And it looks like we don't have any other questions, Diana, um, but I really wanted to thank you so much for joining me today and talking about how you use Hypothesis. And um, we were just so excited to, to learn about um, how you're using it and how your students are loving it. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we will also be sending this recording out to um, to everyone as well. So thank you.